Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the Your Forest Podcast, round two. I got Derek Krieger-Smith on the episode again today. We're going to be talking in more in depth about sustainable forest management. Uh, like I said last time, he is a registered forestry professional in the province of Alberta, same as myself. So yeah, we're going to get we're going to get into some details about what exactly sustainable forest management is and why it's important. So I guess the first thing to know is that sustainable forest management as a super basic idea is just keeping the forests and the natural areas exactly the way they are for infinitum. I like that word. Infinitum. Or that too. Either pronunciation works. I honestly don't. I think it's a tomato tomato thing. Yeah, that was a creepy voice though. Maybe don't do that again. Sorry about it. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> moving along. So uh, yeah, sustainable forest management. We want to keep the trees and vegetation and the animals and the fish and the air quality and the soil, everything the way it is from now until something happens that we can't stop, like an asteroid hits or like something crazy. Like the heat crazy. death of the universe? Yeah. Entropy? Let's say climate change ruins everything. So, barring climate change, <laughs> we want to keep things the way they are. So, the way that forest companies start doing that they plan for very specific values. Uh, one of those values is uh, diversity. So biodiversity in many different aspects. So you're talking about ecosystem biodiversity. So that's maintaining basically the whole mosaic of the landscape, working together, making sure that the water levels stay the same. You're making sure that nutrient levels stay the same for all the plants. You're making sure that habitat doesn't change. It's basically the whole, the whole kit, the whole thing. So they get into more detail into their planning. They go into very defined detail, actually. Uh, I'm just going to vamp a little bit on the mosaic. So when we say the mosaic, what we're referring to is um, the variance between uh, ages of trees, the different species, uh, the different uh, moisture regimes, the different nutrient regimes. And so those are all different ecosystems. They support different plant life. They support different wildlife. You can have your old growth forest where you get your good lichens that you use for caribou and stuff. And then you can have your really young forests that are just basically um, small aspen and poplar. And those are good for like deer and moose that are browsing, right? So yeah. you need to have a really good diversity of ages and species and all these other things because it gives you um, the biodiversity that we need to support you know, different plant life, yep. different wildlife. Yeah, the biodiversity is key to keeping, yeah, keeping things biodiverse. <laughs> as simple <laughs> as that. Like it's, you're, yeah, the more different age stands you have or different types of vegetation you have or even just different natural subregions, everything provides a different habitat for different things. So you want to keep those things up to date. You want to keep them available for now until forever. So like Derek was saying, smaller, younger stands, younger forested stands, I should say, uh, they provide a lot of good, a lot of good, or a lot of good browse, browse for, uh, moose and other animals that like to browse like that. They're, uh, yeah, it keeps them going. So when we actually do make cut blocks, the new growth coming up is super rich and it's it's yeah, it's plentiful for yep. those kind of animals. So they'll they'll flourish in those types of areas. And there's even different like bird species and stuff that'll nest in certain ages of stands versus others. Yeah, totally. The uh, the they support different insects. Yep. Right, different food sources, different uh, seed sources. Every time you change a cereal stage, and I guess I should explain a cereal stage. A cereal stage is just the different, the different stages of uh, of plant growth and the and the mosaic which uh, stands go through. So they start out with aspen, and the aspen grows up, and the spruce comes up underneath because it's a shade tolerant species, and eventually that turns into a mixed wood stand where you got aspen and spruce in the middle, both together, and then you've got eventually it turns into a mature stand where you've got mostly conifer-based spruce stand and uh, ends up being a pretty old, lots of vertical structure, lots of habitat for birds, for woodpeckers and squirrels and all kinds of different things. Everything's in there. So, yeah, the importance of biodiversity of landscape is unsurmountable. 
you definitely want it. Uh, and people always look at things like cup locks and they get worried. They go, oh, look at that. They're, you know, they're pillaging the landscape. There's nothing left. Like there's what's going to grow there. It's a parking lot or what kind of animals are going to exist there. But yeah, it's, or it's, it's bad and it won't be good until it's as big as it was when they cut it. Yep. But it has value through all of its, all of its growth and all yep. of its life cycle until it gets back up to that point. Yeah. And people think that they, they, they look at those cup blocks and they think that, oh, it's, it's, it's a parking lot, like I said. Right. But it's, it's not. That's it's simulating. The idea is simulating natural disturbance. So when a fire comes through or a big wind windstorm comes through, what do you think happens? New growth comes up, and there has to be a diversity of fauna that take advantage of that situation because it's a it's a it's a new situation. It doesn't last long. That new growth only lasts for a few years before it's too high to browse, and yeah, they take advantage of it. Yeah, so like if you're if you're a hawk or an eagle or something and you're looking for mice, pretty tough to spot them through, you know, what, 14 meter tall, completely closed aspen. Yeah. Like you, you can't even see the ground. You just see leaves, right? Yeah. But if you have a recent cup rock or a recent burn, a recent disturbance, yeah. now it's opened up and now you have your birds of prey that are able to actually yeah. see prey on the ground, right? So yep. they require a level of opening or a level of disturbance mm-hmm. just to survive. Yep. If it was all old growth forest, they wouldn't eat. We wouldn't yeah. have them. Yeah, no, totally. It's it's all of those things are needed. And that's what we're trying to get into today. We're trying to explain to everybody so that everyone understands why every different stage of growth in a forested stand is crucial to the biodiversity of the landscape. And that forest management companies are doing their best. They're trying very deeply to make sure that those things exist forever. And that is in everybody's interest. I spend a lot of time um, online trying to harp that. A lot of people always go, oh, well, old growth is key. Old growth is the best. Old growth is, you know, just the best forest you can possibly have. It's it's top notch. It's like, well, it's really not. If you look at, you know, the species that old growth is supporting, like true old growth, true mm-hmm. climax. Yeah. It, it's it's not great. Maybe you've got some lichens that can support like a niche thing like the caribou. Yeah. There's, there's absolute value to every cereal stage and every point of a forest growth. Yeah. But, Deer can't really browse on a hundred and twenty year old fur. Yeah. They they need, you know, young aspen, young poplar. Yeah. You know, again, the maybe the eagles can nest there if it's on the border of a disturbance, mm-hmm. but they're not really finding mice. Owls might thrive. Yeah. Maybe I don't even know if mice are in there. It's just moss. Yeah. Do they have a food source? Who knows? So old I'm growth. I'm guessing they eat something. Yeah, they, they gotta eat something, right? <laughs> That's what that's what animals do. If they don't eat meat, they eat plants. All the plants are the same, so they eat something. <laughs> but it, old growth is great. It's really important, and we should protect it. We always need to have a little bit of it to support different species. But at the end of the day, if the whole if the whole province was old growth, first of all, it would burn overnight. That's the biggest thing is that it's it's a fire hazard. Huge fire hazard. Yeah, there's a lot of dead standing timber. There's a lot of there's a lot of ladder fuel. So I'll, I'll explain ladder fuel. Um, Ladder fuel is when you have a fire coming through, a lot of times this, they'll start, they don't generally start at the top of a tree. They start in the grass, they start in the roots, and they slowly turn it, climb their way up, slow, you know, or small small, small trees and low-hanging branches. They'll small slowly shrubs. climb their way up, small shrubs, and they'll slowly climb their way up into the canopy. But they don't generally stay in the canopy unless it's super, super hot, dry, and windy. Yeah, very specific conditions. So... The ladder fuels is literally those intermittent sized trees and vegetation that allow something to go from the grass up 30 meters into the canopy. So those types of things are readily abundant in old growth stands. And although those things are super important, like we said. Can't have them everywhere. Yeah, which is kind of one of the problems we're running into now with such giant fires around lately taking over, you know, taking down communities and it's 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 not good and that's that's partly to do with our management of it and we because we do have so much old growth out there but uh like again that's that's so, a that's for another podcast can i can i say it very quickly can yeah I, no can go I for do it, it in under a minute can i do it okay so we've been suppressing wildfires since 1950 ish and so when you come with suppressing wildfire all these little fires that used to just burn you know one or two areas or just the understory they don't happen anymore so now we get shrubs growing in the understory there's the stories of the pioneers when they came through they could ride their wagons mm-hmm. right through the forest and now you you can't see 50 meters through the trees it's all just alder yeah so now we have forests that aren't burning uh, with low intensity regular fires to take out the shrub 
So now we have old trees. We have thick shrub that goes up to the bottom of the branches. We have those ladder fuels. Yeah. And so now every little fire hits great ladder fuels, hits old trees, hits great conditions. You know, climate change, you can you can confirm or deny it all you want, but our weather is very different. And it's, it's helping with a lot of the fire seasons. So yeah. instead of getting these small little fires that would burn this patch and go, oh, there's a little piece of the mosaic now. Yeah. It's been reset to its own little time scale. We're resetting huge swaths of land to like, okay, that burned that year. Yeah. So our mosaic is getting coarser. Yeah. And, and that has less value intrinsically than yeah. having lots of little pieces. Yep. So basically what you're trying to say is the... We spent a lot of time managing fires and stopping fires that are natural on the land base. They started for a reason and they started because that's how the boreal forest replenishes itself. It's how it keeps new growth. It has how it keeps that mosaic going. It's how it keeps it's how we keep the biodiversity. But because we have intervened as people, we have taken over, you know, giant chunks of land and created agriculture. We've created homes for ourselves and communities and highways space. and recreational space and it's all yeah. We, we need to protect those things, right? Forest, so because right. we needed to protect those things, we had to stop wildfires, and that created a inventory of available fuel that generally wasn't there in the past. So now we have these high-intensity, large fires that once they get going, they keep just rolling because we can't – they weren't burned before. They should, have, they should have been burned, say, 20 or 40 or 50 years ago. And unfortunately, you might all be thinking like, oh, okay, well, we should stop – <laughs> stop, suppressing fire. stop suppressing fire in some areas that are wild but the problem is the areas where we have big fires that are wild they turn into communities real quick because they're moving quickly so it doesn't take long for them to go from being a wild area totally don't have to worry about you know trappers cabins or you know communities or well sites and then they automatically they turn into yep. run right up next to communities so yep. we are at a point now where unfortunately we can't just say well we, we can stop fighting fire we have to keep going yeah, we have there's to keep no there's it. no no let it burn that no. doesn't happen it's it is what it is we did it we got to uh yeah yeah this is our lot we have to lay in our bed yeah absolutely we do for sure we started we can't just stop now so um that's old growth old growth like Derek was saying it's super diverse it holds lots of different types of habitat that only exist at that age class so Forest companies want to make sure that those age classes exist, but we also want to make sure that we're managing them and making sure that there's only a certain percentage of the landscape that is that old so that we don't have that high risk of high intensity fires coming through and, and burning through resources. So although they will go through burnt areas and we will salvage timber out of them. So don't think that all those fires that do burn through all that wood is wasted. Um, there are some legalities there but uh, they do try to take as much wood as possible from those burned areas to try and save the stuff that didn't burn for later so they are thinking about all that it is it's it gets pretty complicated but that's just it for now yeah another thing just to talk about biodiversity um is access so when we go onto the forest resource if we're cutting an area if we're going through to do research plots whatever if we're building roads or creating access um closing that access behind us is very important so there's a lot of planning in terms of uh building a large road that you'll run for 20 years and then you branch off of that maybe those roads are open for five years and then you get your one-year roads off of that that typically go into your cup locks mm -hmm. so there's a whole whole scale of road planning and those are meant to close up after you're done using them right they fan out like arteries yeah. and then you close them up and that's to protect so if we're talking about biodiversity that's to protect um poachable species yeah. Or species that are really sensitive to human impact. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's any of your big predators, typically. Um, Generally then, speaking, the like wolves and big predators will take advantage of straight anthropogenic lines. They, they, can, they can move quickly across them and track and see all the tracks going across. So they can cover a lot of ground and they can, they can easily hunt those lines. So every time we fragment the landscape with cut blocks or cut lines or pipelines, we make it easier for predators. Um, yeah, sorry to cut you off. No, no worries. So when we talk about fragmenting, anytime we create a linear disturbance, right? So we put a seismic line in, we put a road, we put a pipeline. Um, prey animals are very wary of open spaces. 
and they they're will smart. they're very smart they know if they walk out onto that pipeline that there's going to be a wolf or something that's you know a cougar sitting up in a tree watching the line there's all sorts of predators that take advantage of that mm-hmm. so they're hesitant to cross these new linear features we create and that can result in uh, genetic stagnation which can be a big problem um, up in Jasper and Banff that they're finding there's just so many highways and yeah. and big trails and lines that have been cut that they're worried the genes aren't flowing between all these little pockets. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where you get the, I think it's the, is it the Banff Highway Project where they have the big the, animal crossings? The wildlife corridors. Yeah. 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 So those big, when you're driving through Banff uh, or past Banff, I guess, all through the, all through the, uh, into the BC even, they have those giant look like bridges going over top of Nothing. Yeah, it looks like an underpass when you drive under it. Yeah, and there's there's you can see vegetation, there's trees and shrubs and stuff on top of them. And a lot of people are wondering, well, what the heck is that? What's the purpose? That seems like a waste. But those are wildlife corridors. That's so the animals can come through them. And yeah, it's 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 good, but unfortunately, it's not the best because they also create pinch points for predators to. They do. So I know. actually have a cool story about this. Um, with junior forest rangers, I got to work on one of those. So they have, at the very top of that, they have a barbed wire fence. Yeah. And they had a pack of, like a strip of really fine sand on one side. And then they have you a trail cam. facing the, like, highways? Not No, just, so um, if the corridor travels perpendicular to the highway. Yeah. Um, they have a barbed wire fence. Yeah. That's parallel with the highway. Oh, okay. So the animals would have to cross under it or through it. Or oh, okay. Over it. Hmm. The point of that is that it snags uh, hair samples. Oh, yeah, And yeah. they're tracking the flow of genes. Yeah. Um, so we so went scientific through studies, scientific yeah. studies and then the fine track of sand is for footprints ah. and paw prints so they can identify species and, and animals that have gone through. And then they have a trail cam with a motion sensor. So, um, we went and worked on it. We put in an, a second, uh, line of sand on the other side so yep. that they had two sides and they actually sent us a photo a couple days later and it was like an hour after we'd left the biggest grizzly I'd ever seen <laughs> was on this trail cam and they were like, you did it. And <laughs> I remember that barbed wire fence when I was a teenager it was just high enough that I could throw a leg over yeah. and I had to push the bar wire down so it didn't hit anything important. <laughs> and uh, that grizzly bear made that thing look like it was, you know, a, a picket fence for a dollhouse. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. No, they're big animals. Probably as tall as I was. Yeah. They're definitely not teddy bears. When you oh, see one sitting oh, no. on its ass on the side of the highway with its all its paws in front of them kind of looking cuddly. Yeah. Don't, don't stop to take pictures or... You know, stick your hand out, try and give it a high five. It's not a good idea. Yeah, don't stop to take pictures. Don't throw rocks at it so it'll stand up. I've heard all sorts of yeah. stories, whether they're true or not. I've heard yeah. horror stories. From What's them. a big one? People stopping to take pictures in, in the parks there is bad because they, they don't realize, like, oh, I'm on the shoulder, I'm on the side of the road, you know, I'm I'm out of the way, but you're not. Like, accidents are caused that way. People get concerned. They're wondering, what's going on? Like, should I stop and help? Oh, they're looking at animals. They might oh, maybe I should stop and look at the animal. Because they're worried about hitting someone on the shoulder and then the person behind them isn't looking and then there's a rear end and it's just... Yeah. Just don't so, stop. Leave the wildlife yeah. alone. It's very pretty. I know. You want to look at it. I know. Yeah. Pictures in Google. Also, bull elk. Those bull elk you see on the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. If it's anywhere near August, September, don't, don't get out of your vehicle. Yeah. They will gorge you. They have swords on their heads. Yeah, they, yeah, they actually do. <laughs> I mean, man, they could easily damage your vehicle. What are they going to do to an actual person? Yeah, you, know? you, you don't want that thing coming yeah. at you, trust me. It looks it looks cool, and it is cool. They're awesome. Look at them from your car. They are majestic. Stay there. And they are not for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, some of the other things we talked about stand level structure. That is what we were talking about with the different age classes and biodiversity. And uh, we talked about access. What else can we talk about regarding biodiversity? Uh, we can talk about um, things you do when you're harvesting. So things like retention or um, leaving behind oh, yeah, yeah, wildlife yeah. value for from sure. blowdown or things like that. Yes, totally. So like we were saying before in the old growth stands, you get lots of like bird habitat and small rodent habitat in leaving some older trees in the uh, in the cup blocks. Okay, so you get retention. And those provide just some shelter from the wide open expanse that is the cup block. Yep. Also, they create wildlife corridors like they do in Banff. It's, although instead of a bridge, you just have a row of trees or not just one row of trees, but... Like a mul- little strip. A little strip. can sneak through and yeah. not feel threatened. They can sneak through and not feel threatened. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. So we leave those on purpose. Um, they're in strategic spots where planners believe that animals will be trying to cross they're not randomly placed they're generally done strategically 
Yeah, they try to work with with natural uh, corridors. Yeah. Animals like to move along water courses. Typically, yeah. it's a little bit easier walking than through the proper bush. Um, some of the other things I know I've done when I've done layout is uh, you can leave if there's a tree and it's broken mm -hmm. halfway up or something so yeah. that the top is snapped off you can leave those as perch trees yeah. for birds of prey after the block is cut again because mm -hmm. you're having those, those predatory birds and they're looking for mice and yeah. they need a break they can't fly all day in the heat so yeah. there's value to that um, you get sections that are blown down mm -hmm. so you get these big uh, we call them jackpots and yeah. it's just trees on trees on trees it almost looks like a beaver dam it gets very convoluted it's a mess it's a, it's a total mess. Yep. And you can leave those, and those provide uh, habitat for uh, rodents. Or even bears. Even Oh, yeah, even bears. Bears, yeah. Will, bears will actually den under those uprooted trees in the wintertime. They'll crawl right underneath, and the snow kind of comes over top. You wouldn't, wouldn't even know. I, know. I know a person, actually, who was, they were trekking their way through the bush in the middle of wintertime, and they come up over this little lump, right, uh, uh, and just you're trying to get over. There's lots of there's lots of branches and trees and down logs, and you're just trying to find the easiest route through. And the easiest route through for this woman was to go over this hump, and it was a root ball. So she wasn't worried about it. She stepped on it. Her leg went through. Oh no! And she felt something move. And she had a <laughs> that's not okay. A boar, a black bear boar. Burst out from between her legs and run in a straight line. Yeah, so she was she had an interesting day. That's no. I should ask her. I don't remember if she uh, if she continued to work that day or not. I don't recall. You know what? If it were me, that's a you know what? That's my day. Next time I see her, I'll 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 ask her. No, I had a I had a day once where I got stung seven times. I we got out of our truck, we walked over, we got stung seven times each, and we got back in our truck and we went home. <laughs> I had had it. My hands were starting to swell up. Poor baby. Not, not doing it. Yeah, poor baby. <laughs> there are things that'll happen every once in a while. Things that'll happen, you go, you know what? Not our day. No. And you just pack up and go home. Yeah. There yeah. Nature wins sometimes. Sometimes nature wins. Yeah. Sometimes it's just not safe. Um so yeah, I was gonna talk about the other thing I was gonna talk about for biodiversity was uh regarding buffers that we create to maintain biodiversity in say species at risks or or even uh watershed. That can be so discussed. Important. Like that's also part of the soil and water erosion and protection there, right? Yep. So we can kind of get two and one there with that one. Uh, forest companies leave when they go through to, to cut an area. They have a pretty good idea of what they're going to cut, but they send people out to ribbon off the section that they're going to cut. And while those people are ribboning off, laying out, which is what Derek did for a long time, they are watching out for streams, and each each different size of stream has a different buffer distance yep. that it requires depending on the on the size of the stream uh whether it's fish bearing and all kinds of other things mm -hmm. uh also they're looking out for net nests any kind of nests birds of prey or any, anything else birds of prey dens yeah anything that looks like it's burrowing or has a home yeah so there's all kinds of different different factors that they're keeping their eyes out for springs mineral licks are a springs, huge one mineral licks so uh, so springs you guys know what springs are i'm, I'm thinking it's where water comes out from straight from underneath the soil so it's yeah coming out from the water table uh and then mineral lick is so animals like ungulates like moose and deer and elk they require a lot of salt and not just them i'm, I'm bears and everything else requires minerals right yeah, but all the animals require minerals specifically the ungulates require a lot of them because they're trying to grow swords on their head every year yeah those require a lot Fair of point. calcium so <laughs> mineral licks are places in the in the landscape where the water table has come up and exposed a layer of highly rich mineral soil. Like super, super salty water, basically. Essentially, yeah. So you'll, you'll if you're walking around through the bush, you might run into these. It looks like... They're muddy. It They're looks so muddy. It looks yeah. like a rodeo pen after a rain. Exactly. Ball. That's what I was going to say. It looks like a bunch of horses. It looks like a rain and a bunch of horses and cows and stuff are stomping around. That's And that's what that is. That's a mineral lick. You can so. actually see them on aerial photographs. Yeah. Be, they almost look like a, like a sea urchin. Mm -hmm. Because they have so much foot traffic in and out that yeah. you can see all the all the paths that the animals yeah. have taken just to come. Like it's it's your hub, it's your your shopping mall for wildlife. Everything goes there. You know, thinking about those, it makes me think about the Lion King. I wonder if they got like a bit of a truce when it comes to the mineral. Like I wonder, hey, <laughs> hey the grizzly looks up and the deer looks up and they're like, 
We'll, we'll deal with this later. I'm going to go ahead and say no. It's not as crucial as water in the Serengeti. But. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, we're both thirsty. We'll fight later. Just yeah. drink. I don't think that's happening. No, I don't think so either. It's a cute thought. Yeah. Not a Disney movie. Yeah. Anthropomorphizing those animals. Yeah, don't do that. They're not teddy bears. We got we to gotta curb that. That's another thing we have to curb the whole in the public. Teddy bear. Yeah. yeah. They're not friendly. They're not domesticated. They're totally wild. And almost all of them can hurt you or kill you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely don't mess with the bears. Nature wins. They're not fun. Nope. They're cool to look at. Yeah. Look at them from your truck. Yeah, so mineral licks, are, <laughs> mineral licks are a huge, uh, a huge uh, natural occurrence that we we do a lot of. We do big buffers to protect those because they're super important. They're pretty far and few between. And like we said, pretty much every piece of wildlife travels to them to uh, to get some very important nutrients. Yep. No, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, there's also genetic diversity. Um, you're trying to protect invasive species from coming in. There's, oh, invasive species. See, that's, that's some biodiversity the, we don't need. Well, that's part of the access. Thing yes, too, you're right. right? It, it absolutely is. So, uh, like Derek was saying before, how forest companies will create access by building roads, temporary roads, or long-term roads, and in, in block roads. And a lot of those get pulled out. And one of the main reasons is invasive species. So, when a vehicle comes in, a lot of times there are seeds and spores and all kinds of things on the tires that you don't realize is on the vehicle. And when you're driving down the road, those things are released into the ditch and now become invasive species because they are not natural to the land base. There are a lot of these. Uh, in agriculture, like any time you're in the, the white zone, yeah. they're worried about uh, club root is the big one. Field to field, yeah. you can transfer it through truck tires and yeah. equipment. Yeah, that's, so that's a good example. Canola, I think. I'm not sure what species it affects. Yeah. Um, I just know it's a big My agriculture is not up to date, people, so don't hold it's, me against that it's one. It's been but. a minute since I've worked in the rural, so it, yeah. I just remember they were just starting to implement different classifications of sanitizing our vehicles. Yeah. So if we were in an area where we knew there was a uh, club route, then yeah. we had to actually go and get hot um, water with a sanitizer in it and completely wash our trucks and yeah. to be able to move on to a different field. So we didn't transfer. Yeah. And the invasive species, it's a big one. And pretty much all the grasses that you're going to see in the ditch, they're all invasive. They're they're not natural. Yeah. Yeah, what what grass species do we get that move into the forest? Like, For, I forget it, from PLVI, what are those? Invasives, you mean? Well, what are the agricultural species that we use? Oh, I'm not sure about the specifics of that. I don't know. Okay. That's, not, that's definitely yeah. not my area of expertise. <laughs> yeah. I don't claim to be a, an expert at all things I forestry and grasses ecological. And yeah. Um, so yeah, so you can get agricultural species of grasses yeah. that we use um, in the farmlands yeah. that shouldn't really be in the the true forest. Yeah. So you can get. I mean, you can even find dandelions and stuff on right of ways and stuff going into the forest. Like you find species that should never be up there. Yeah. You'll never if you walk into the true forest. Yeah. Find me a dandelion. Yeah. I dare you. You can't find it. No, they're not there. It's always on disturbances. Yep. No, for sure. So yeah, invasive species. They're a problem. That's why we restrict access. Like I was saying last time, restricting access sometimes is required to protect our resources. Zebra mussels are a huge oh, that's, uh, part of that for boating. So if you build a we'll road, the Great Lakes, yeah, yeah, and you get back to these small ponds that you normally wouldn't have like huge proper road access to. People bring their boats, right? Mm-hmm. Albertans, Canadians, we love to put boats on any piece of water big enough to hold them, <laughs> and uh, it's it's very easy to transfer uh, zebra mussels or their spores. I believe that's. Or I forget the the name of their small reproductive. Oh, I don't know. Like their egg or whatever. I remember learning that in university, but that was a while ago. Yes. At any rate, um, we're starting to do boat stops and stuff. Yeah. Um, and cleanings along the highway to stop the spread of zebra mussels. If you don't know what they are, I really encourage you to go and look them up. And if you are a boater, you should know what they are. Yeah. You should be very wary about them. Yeah. The, the boating that I do do is pretty much only on Lester Slave Lake. That's where I grew up and that's where our boats are and that's where they stay. And as far as I know, there's no zebra mussels there. And, but yeah, if we were to go out and, you know, take our watercraft elsewhere to other lakes, yeah, you definitely got to, you got to know what's going on there for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And they can sit in like the little bit of water that's caught up in yeah. parts of the ocean. If you have like a jet boat or anything. Yeah. Those little U-bends. 
Yeah. They can sit in there. Like, little cracks and And then they can survive yeah. even dry for a period of time. They can, eh? Oh, it's, they're so bad. Yeah. Zebra mussels are super resilient. I know that they, they, you know, they expand their habitat pretty quickly. Like once they're introduced to an area, they explode and pretty much take over. But I don't know. They so close. Besides that, that's all I really know. Like they'll completely grow over culverts. They'll grow over irrigation pipes. That's yeah, bananas. Like they, they just grow on things. Yeah. Anything they can grow on, they'll just grow. And then they'll grow on top of themselves until they close off. Yeah. Like irrigation pipes anything so Wild. as soon as you introduce them yeah. you know right away because all the shores all the buoys all the docks anything in the water that's handling water mm-hmm. will immediately be full of zebra mussels they're razor sharp that's can't crazy. even get into the water yeah it's terrible all right so the next the next value that we're going to talk about that uh forest managers are managing for and planning for i suppose is ecosystem productivity so ecosystem productivity that is mostly has to do with making sure that anything that is utilized, anything that's cut, harvested, any anything that's used is regrown and regrown properly to specific standards and regrown to the similar or the same type of stand that was originally existent there. So Or if, better. Or or better. Yeah, right. By, by by the same type of stand, I mean the same composition of species, right. more or less. So if we cut down a aspen stand, and aspen is a deciduous tree, which means it's leafy. It's not Chris, not a Christmas tree. It drops its leaves in For winter. For those of you who i have spending the last two podcasts talking about conifer and deciduous and don't know what I'm talking about, deciduous is leafy, conifer is like a Christmas tree. We'll keep it that simple for now. Anyways, if you cut down an aspen stand, you need to regrow an aspen stand. If you cut down a mixwood stand, which means you have a aspen spruce or aspen pine stand, you need to regrow a mixwood stand. You can't have one or the other. Uh, there are some arguments, more in-depth forestry-related scientific arguments for following cereal stages. So that would be cutting down an aspen stand and planting a mixwood stand, things like that. There's arguments. There, I know it's it's up in the air. It's not right now. We just we plant what we cut, That's which is, I think, is we just keep it simple. We don't want to start pretending like we know what the forest is going to do in the future. Yeah. But we try to do our best. So, uh, like I said, we tr- they when they cut a area, they will go through and plant it to a specific density. Make sure that those trees, they'll come back every... They come back... I'm trying to remember how long the regeneration surveys are. They're, I want to say the establishment... First one, six... I think establishment is six years, and uh, they do two. Um, they do two sets of surveys after a block has been cut. So they do the establishment, and that's measuring to make sure that the trees are coming back, yeah. and that the stocking is sufficient. So there's yeah. enough trees per unit of area. So doing regeneration regeneration surveys, and they come back. It's on the twelfth year, I'm pretty sure. I think is I what think the is last 12. one. Yeah, the regen is twelve. So establishment is six, I think, and regen is twelve. And that means the six years they're going in, they're making sure that the trees that they put there, or if they left it for natural because it was going to come back, they need to make sure that they are established and that they are going to grow. And if that is the case, they're, they, they're agreed they're going to establish, they come back on the 12th year and they make sure that they are growing at a particular rate. They're not being hindered by anything that might be messing up. They want to make sure that these trees are going to grow back to be full mature trees without any problems because that's their... Yeah, we want to make sure that those trees exist. Yeah, using the data from the first set of surveys and then the second set, you have that six-year gap and you can kind of extrapolate mm-hmm. what the growth is going to look like. And if that growth, that projected growth looks good, yeah. it'll get what's called free to grow. Yeah, And that means that the mill or whoever cut it is no longer liable for that area in terms of regrowing the forest stock because it's considered to be coming back acceptably. Yeah, And that's really important for a mill. Once an area is free to grow, the mill is then able to cut any other standing merchantable timber adjacent to it mm-hmm. because that area that was first cut that's now free to grow is considered just part of the natural land base again yeah. goes back into their annual allowable cut it does so uh yeah so that's that's extremely important you want to make sure they get that and if they don't reach those establishment and or regeneration surveys they have to spend a bunch of money go back in and make sure that those stands will reach them eventually so yeah. there they there's no there's no cup locks out there that are coming back that are you know they're coming back poorly yeah, and are being sickly, left alone or they're not patchy and barren what well, happens it does happen but they could they go back and they fix that problem yeah. they want to make sure that these things are coming back because they have an invested interest in removing that wood fiber again and 
60, 80, 100 years. Yep. So they want to make sure that that stand is available. If it's Because if they create a stand that is now unproductive, it is removed from their annual elbow cut and they actually lose... Yeah, it's a smaller land base they get to manage for Essentially, productive. Yeah. yeah, you're just you're just leaving money on the table. Do we explain an annual allowable cut? I'm not sure if we, we kind of yeah, touched we on it, but it's basically just that we forest companies will take their land base. They're they're they acquire a specific piece of land, and they take that land base and they take divvy it out into all the things that are merchantable. So they divvy it out into wetlands, which are unmerchantable. They divvy them out into unproductive dry spots and they they basically just remove all the pieces that won't grow good trees and a lot of that is well they won't grow good trees so that's the biggest thing but also they though a lot of those places are sensitive uh even if they wanted to make them productive stands it wouldn't be it wouldn't be wise it would cost a lot of money they have to drain things they have to mess with the ecology they have to it's not good so they don't do it so anyways they take all those all those wet areas and dry areas and they pull them out of the land base and they manage them in the sense that they, they keep them in mind when they're making their plans, but they are only considering upland stands for harvest. Stands that can be can be regrown productively because they don't want to spend a bunch of money on regeneration yeah. Yeah, on silviculture. Silviculture is the regrowth of trees. Yeah. So if you have a if you have a, a black spruce tree, which is one of those um, spruce trees you'll see in bogs, really wet areas, they're typically very thin. They're not very tall. They look very sickly. Mm-hmm. Those species take a very long time to put on very little growth. Yeah. And so not only is it very unproductive from a, a merchantability or from a like a business model, if you're looking at cutting it and then how long it takes to cut it again, it's also very difficult to reforest because when you take those trees off, you take a water pump off the land base so that water table is going to rise so if it's already a swamp with those trees on it what's it going to look like when you cut all of them off it's going to be a duck pond yeah no exactly how do you plant trees in a duck pond you don't you could try you could try waste a lot of money so much (laughs) so what's the point so what's the point of trying to reforce a duck pond when it's it's such a difficult it's just an uphill battle immediately for some stupid sickly trees that took 300 years to get to toothpick size anyway there's yeah. no point so no. we focus on the good upland productive stuff yeah it's just simpler for everybody it's easier to reforest it's just better for everyone in the long term yep totally so that's so the annual allowable cut is determined like derek said before you split the split the forest up into 100 segments and you say the whole forest for simplicity's sake takes 100 years to get back to the way that it was that means they only cut one one hundredth of that productive forest every year yeah so that's the annual allowable cut and when the big fire comes through and takes out a bunch of that their annual allowable cut goes down accordingly they can no longer cut that because it's yeah. been disturbed yep yeah. yeah. but also the the, uh, the but we have so much area we don't really notice right Right. So there's all kinds of things that go into that kind of stuff. So, yep. Um, one thing I did kind of want to talk about since we're on the subject of cut blocks is uh, seed zones mm. and our biodiversity through reforestation from a genetics, tree genetics perspective. Yeah. We can talk about like monocropping and things like that. Yeah. Genetic modification. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know a little more about seed zones and all that, the way that works well, than I do. Kind of. <laughs> well, <laughs> not really. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so if you looked at um, the province, uh, there's different subregions. Mm-hmm. So those are different um, temperate zones, different yep. species thrive in different areas. And then within those, uh, the government has mapped out what are called seed zones. And seed zones are basically genetic adaptations in the species. So while you may have spruce up in uh, High River and you may have spruce over in Drayton Valley, locally, those trees have evolved differently. Those genes have been in an area. Drain Valley's growing conditions are different than yeah. High, High River and all the rest of it. Yep. So when you cut a spruce stand in, um, I don't know, let's say Slave Lake. Mm. So you cut spruce trees in Slave Lake. You can't go all the way up to High River, you know, many, many kilometers away, grab cones from there, grow trees from those seeds, and then plant them in Slave Lake. Yeah. You've moved them out of their seed zone. Yeah. So... There's a chance they won't come back the way they're supposed to, and also you're changing the genetic diversity of the of the land in a arguably bad way because they would never reach there on their own. So yeah. you're yeah. If our logic is you're playing God, you're playing God. If our logic is we cut something and then we put back what was there, we're definitely not wanting to grab seeds and genetic material from across a province or across a country. Yeah. So 
when you cut um when you cut a cup lock they'll actually send uh harvest screws pickers and they'll go out they dip their hands in butter yeah to try to i'm serious to try to deal with the resin yeah and they just pick cones off the uh the down trees so that's all they do all day it's a tough job yeah <laughs> on on a good day it's a really tough job um and they just fill buckets with it. That eventually goes to a nursery. The seeds get processed. They separate the uh, the healthy seeds from basically empty seeds. It's really cool. You should go to Smoky Lake Tree Nursery and get a tour sometimes. Yeah, great. check it out. Yeah. Um, so they process the seeds to make sure they have uh, healthy ones that will grow. They uh, germinate them. They grow seed stock. And then those those saplings that came from that area then go back to that cup lock and get planted. So it really is like a relatively local process. Yeah. Uh, if you pick it from that block, it goes back to that block. Yeah. And that ensures that the same genes are in the same area. They're not, and that's that's where people go wrong. Is people think that I don't know where where the, all these thoughts are come from. They just come from conspiracy theories from the public not knowing and just talking amongst themselves and figuring that oh it's a big corporation they must do what's best for them and only what's best for them and actually what's best for them is what's best for you too. So they actually, yeah, like Derek said, they're not growing some random tree in some genetic diversity lab and making sure that it's perfect. It's got the best growth. It's got all of the best features that you want in a, in a good tree and then planting just that one genetic type across the entire province. That's not happening. No. Don't do that. It's like Derek said, they're taking natural stands, taking natural seeds seed sources and replanting them in their local area the best and the worst and everything in between that came off that cup block yeah gets grown and gets put back yep yep um the other thing is um so i was i was getting my hair cut one time and i don't know why my hairdresser was like oh i can't i'm serious and she was like <laughs> i was talking about forestry and she was like i can't believe uh i talked about uh smoky lake tree improvement center yeah and they went oh i can't believe genetically modified trees blah 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 she went off Oh yeah, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" There's, there's no so mon when we talk about monocrops or monotyping, that's um, that's where you take one tree, right? So you're like, yeah. "This tree grows the best. It's the best so tree. good. It's the best tree. Let's just clone it a million times and plant a million clones of this." When you do that with agriculture, it's one thing. Let's say you plant an entire entire agriculture field is of wheat. totally different situation. Agriculture it, it fails from a blight. Yeah, that's one year that you lost and then you plant a different species that's resistant to the blight it's fine mm -hmm. forestry takes a hundred years to grow a tree let's say you get 70 70 years into that monocrop and then oh there's that one beetle that it's susceptible to or the one pathogen it's susceptible to wipes out like kilometers of forest because you only planted one one set of genes you like you messed up yeah. you lost 70 years of growth yeah. you lost three quarters it's a big investment three generations yep you messed up. You can't do that. So for that reason, we have to make sure that we have genetic biodiversity at the stand level, at the tree yeah. level. Yeah. Although you are creating some pretty awesome bird habitat with those dead stands. Oh, and a fire hazard. <laughs> and, a, and a, like a, a beetle haven. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I just know. Some biodiversity there, but you're losing a lot of more valuable things. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's not something we do. So there's no genetically modified like laboratory level experiment there's no there's, there's no mad scientist anywhere no. that's developing trees that go on to the natural land base. Yeah. There are research plots on leased land yeah. and controlled situations that are not allowed to propagate mm -hmm. where they're doing hybridization um, research plots and things where they're trying to just basically like, hey, can we grow a better tree just for the sake of growing a better tree? Yeah. But those are very controlled and those don't go on to the public, true, natural crown land as we see it. Yep. So it, it's it's like... A scientist growing a strain of wheat in the lab just to be like, hey, can we do it? Can yeah. it grow in the Arctic Circle? Cool, it can grow in the Arctic Circle. doesn't mean we're going to go plant the Arctic Circle. It means look at what I did in the lab. It's very similar to that. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and we're, and we're different from agriculture. Agriculture is trying to do a totally different thing. Agriculture is what's keeping us alive. Thanks, agriculture. Yeah, thanks, agriculture. <laughs> How great is food? <laughs> um, Another thing about uh, soil and water we we're talking about is uh, with those buffers that we were talking about, how you create different size buffers for different size streams. A lot of that has to do with erosion and protecting fish habitat and protecting, creating wildlife corridors and all kinds of different things. But the biggest thing is erosion and sedimentation into the river. So when you cut a cup block, the argument is that you are removing all of the fibrous material holding the soil in place. So when you remove that, all of a sudden, the next time you have a big storm, 
a big rain or in the springtime when you have the overflow, the water or the ground is saturated or it's still frozen perhaps and you have rain coming over top. So you have a lot of water flowing over top of the soil and not seeping in. That creates, that water picks up soil particles, carries them down to the stream and sedimentation occurs, which creates poor habitat for microbes and fish and anything else that might be using that. Um, so the buffers take place. They're supposed to capture anything that might be leaching down into the rivers. That's the point of the buffers. Yeah. Part of the point. So when you leave a buffer, um, especially on, on the larger, so anytime you have a stream that has a defined channel, so you can see it's like, Oh, there's the left of the channel there's right of the channel. There's water in between. You're going to leave a large buffer. And the buffer is going to have greater vegetation, so it's going to have trees. Mm -hmm. But it's also going to have what we call the lesser vegetation, which is your shrubs and your little succulent forbs. It's going to have your flowers, your grasses. Yep. It's going to have all of that. Yep. And the value in that is when you do a uh, clear cut a cup lock, there's a lot of track equipment that goes. And it crushes a lot of your small succulents, a lot of your shrubs. And it, it does do a pretty good job of, of leveling yeah. the place, which mm -hmm. is fine. It's fine. It's part of the process. It's used to fire. It's used to big disturbances that level it. It's fine. But when you have those those cleared spaces, it allows for erosion. Mm -hmm. When you leave those succulents, those shrubs, it'll slow down the water. Mm -hmm. If you can slow down the water that's carrying that dirt, it doesn't have the momentum to hold on to the dirt. Mm -hmm. And it'll drop the sediment in the grass. Yeah. And then it'll allow this cleaner, filtered, you know, uh, no soil in the water to trickle into that stream. Yeah. And then further down. So you've stopped the sedimentation in the grass mm -hmm. rather than in the creek. Yeah. And then that that really ripples up if you think about every small creek up in the yeah. foothills rippling down all the way to something like the North Saskatchewan. Yeah. So there you go. So that's the erosion side of it. So we are watching out for that sort of thing. Um, yeah. That's that stuff. Well, it's even, um, there's an argument to be made about when you strip the soil, you're not just taking, oh, it's like dust that the trees grow in or, or the plants grow in. There's nutrients in there as well. So anytime you're stripping the dirt off and moving it away, you're moving nutrients out of the system, right? So there was there's a bunch of stuff in there. It's gone now. Now when the next generation of trees grow, it has less nutrients um, to build itself back up. Yep. It's permanently had a net loss. Yep. So erosion works for protecting fish habitat. It works for protecting uh, the viability of the soils for new plant growth. And it's just better all around for clean drinking water and more productive ground. Yeah. Yeah. So, Keep the dirt where it is. That's that's the goal. Yeah, exactly. So some of the things that we have talked about, so what, what, have, what have we missed? We, we got conservation of biological diversity. We've got the maintenance and enhancement of forest ecosystems, condition and productivity, uh, conservation of soil and water. Uh, hmm. The forest, we can talk about the global carbon storage, recreational value, and if we wanted to, we could talk about First Nation values as well. Well, I think we'll brush on them quickly. We're already working up 47 minutes here. We don't want to make this thing three hours. So, well, we'll I'm going to make, I want to make a whole podcast regarding global ecological cycles, the forests, talking about carbon cycling and all that. That's, that's a whole bag of worms that I, it's super interesting. And uh, yeah, I think we should talk about that again. Because we've had some good conversations in the past on that kind of thing. I think we could definitely... I think I could speculate. camp on that. Yeah, yeah. I, think I, could, I think I could do some wild, <laughs> irresponsible speculating about carbon cycles it's fun on, though, a, right? on a planet level. Yeah, and then so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that, I think, some other time. For right now, we'll keep it simple. We'll talk about some, maybe the multiple benefits to society, so multiple use values. So, like I said before, forest companies are planning around your needs especially if you're speaking up they want to know what you want if you have a trap line in an area they want to know if you have you know there's if there's lots of say atv traffic responsible atv traffic in an area they want to make sure that those are maintained they don't want to ruin them um yeah there's there's aboriginal use yep. there's a lot of traditional use that the aboriginal communities utilize the forest for so we want to make sure that they're not trampling on those areas and making sure that they're protecting those traditional use yeah, spots so absolutely so there's even um when we talk about um managing a cup lock or if we're going to go through and cut a timber one of the things we manage for is aesthetics so if you're going to be cutting a cup lock right beside a highway yeah it's very common to leave 
more wood between the road and the cup lock yeah. and that'll reduce the visibility of this large opening you've created from the highway. Yeah. So that gives you the illusion of I'm driving down the road and there's trees everywhere as far as I can <laughs> see. You'd be like, well, 75 meters off the highway, mm-hmm. it's actually clear cut, but yeah. you'll never know. And that's, and you shouldn't know because you shouldn't have to look at a big, ugly clear cut people get a upset. major highway people get upset with the cut blocks the the big clear cuts yeah because they, they they look ugly the first couple of years but you come back in five years time and you're going to have a try to walk through it yeah it's going to be dense so yeah. those forests come back quickly super super quickly i mean yeah. that's our forests evolve from large-scale disturbances yeah. like fire so clear cutting does a good job of bringing back a lot of those species and they come back really thick yeah totally yeah. but uh yeah so some of the like aboriginal traditional use uh they have all kinds of medicines, prayer trees. Um, yeah, there's, they have all kinds of different things that they utilize the forest for. And we want to make sure that we maintain their traditional use and make sure that they can still continue to pass on those traditions to their younger generation and keep those things going, right? Because we want, we want that around. It's super interesting stuff. I well, don't know is, a lot about a- it personally, but I, eventually one day I'll definitely, I'll, I'm going to try and find uh, somebody I can have on that knows a little bit more about it. We can you know, talk in detail about it. I definitely want to learn more. I have two stories about changing how we were going to manage the forest based on First Nations and their values and their um, their traditional use areas. So yep. uh, the first one was I was laying out a cup lock, as you do when you do cup lock layout, and I was walking. It's kind of, you know how I scare very easily. <laughs> this People, is, he this scares is literally, extremely This is the easily. dumbest thing. So I'm walking through the forest and I'm looking at trees and I'm looking up and I'm looking down, but I'm not really looking too, too far ahead of me. Yeah. And I look up and there's this huge <laughs> dark thing. Like it, it's dark, like shale, like rock. <laughs> and it's the size of a house. Yeah. And I feel like it snuck up on me, which is a ridiculous concept because <laughs> I walked up to it very slowly, tying ribbon, <laughs> but I wasn't paying attention. And I look and it's actually a massive rock. Yeah. It's the size of a, probably a bungalow. Yeah. And it's just sitting there in the middle of the trees. Massive yeah. rock. I couldn't even, I couldn't climb up on top of it if I tried. Yeah. It's covered in moss. They've got And you're not talking about plants. standing in the middle of the mountains where you're going to have oh, no. giant boulders. You're talking. Oh, I'm just talking like just, just in the middle of a, in, of a patch of trees. Relatively flat forested area. Nowhere where a rock could have fallen and landed in the trees. Yeah. So it's a, what we call an erratic from the glacier. So it's just a big rock that a glacier was carrying. And as it receded, it decided, boop, I'm going to drop this big rock right here. Yeah. It was probably a piece that chipped off of the mountains, got carried all the way here. And then when it receded, it dropped. Yeah. So it's this huge rock. It scared me, which is stupid. <laughs> but I thought, wow, this is amazing. You, you really don't walk up on building sized rocks in the middle of nowhere every no. day. You walk in the forest startling, every day. For you sure. never, it was yeah. really startling. It was yeah. very strange. So I, I marked it on my GPS and I thought, this is so interesting raced ahead to meet up with uh, the other person I was tying ribbon with and then was like, you have to see this rock. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I didn't even tell him. I said, come with me. He goes, what? And I said, shut up and come with me. And we walked back, took five minutes. He gets back and he goes, what am I looking at? And I said, take it in for a second. And he just kind of let his eyes, <laughs> like let his vision kind of widen to what he was looking at and went, oh. And I went, yeah, it's a huge rock, which is an amazing novelty when you walk through the forest all day and never see them. So big rocks, people. Big rocks. So uh, <laughs> later we were talking with the mill we were contracted to, and we said, you know, there's this huge rock over here. Like it's it's a marvel. Yeah. But it's gonna give you problems operationally. Like you're gonna have to cut around this huge rock. There's n- nothing to do with it. No way to move it. And uh, and they went okay, yeah. And so we put it on our maps. We said big rock, like it was on our maps. And went big to the rock. mill, and they went to do their First Nations consultation. Yeah. And they actually it was on the maps, and they mentioned it to the First Nations, and they said. Oh yeah, that's that's the big rock, <laughs> and they went like, "What do you mean?" And apparently, this is uh, a historical meeting place. Right. Like you would say, "Oh, meet me at the big rock." Right. And that was the meeting spot. So yeah. traditional and use been passed down for yeah, generations. That and was, generations. Yeah. yeah, generations of First Nation people have been meeting at that spot. Yeah. Because it is such a, a crazy feature on the land base. Yeah, it's so unique. And so. Yeah. Just walking up and thinking, huh, that's a huge rock. You don't see that every day. Yeah, people and could And thinking have to carry that. it forward yep. and then having to go to consultation. Totally. We ended up dropping that entire cup lock. Thanks, the entire Derek. cup lock. Because, because I saw a big rock that spooked me because it snuck up on me. <laughs> um, and then the other one was uh, driving out of an area, same area. Um, we were close to the reserve and uh, I saw some shirts that were tied to trees and i've taken enough aboriginal yeah. sensitivity training and some yeah. 
cultural uh, courses to know. I went, oh, those are medicine trees. Yeah. And I went, oh, those are medicine trees. Yeah. And then I looked at my map and I looked at where I was and I took a point on my GPS and I went back to the mill and I said, so there's medicine trees on this point and there's three cup locks within, mm. you know, three or 400 meters. And they went, yeah, those are going to go. And they ended up yeah. dropping three cup locks to create, you know, at least, I think it was at least a kilometer buffer, maybe more. Yeah. They just gave them a really wide berth. Yeah. And I'm not even really sure what the traditional use is behind the medicine trees, although I have run into them and they are. They're like trees that have cloth, lot, very bright colored cloth wrapped around them in different yeah. areas. And yeah, they have a purpose. So we want to make sure we protect those things. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like I said, culture. I'll have to have somebody on that is more informed about that yeah. situation than I am. And it's, it's, it's super interesting. And I kind of feel bad for not knowing more about it now that I think about it. I think I know. But I really don't want to speak to it if yeah. I'm going to butcher it. No, exactly. It's it's an it's important thing to uh, to manage for for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so that was a uh, yeah that was a long podcast. Yeah, covered a lot of stuff. Like it's I I, I realized now that we have went off a few tangents. We uh, <laughs> kind of are all over the place a little bit. Sustainable forest management. I hope it's better understood now. I mean, uh, we went over a lot of stuff. Biodiversity. Protecting and conserving soil and water, uh, traditional use, multiple use values to society. Genetic biodiversity. Genetic biodiversity. Limiting access. Limiting access. A little bit of vote fire. Um, fire. Yeah, there's a lot, lot left to talk about. It sounds really straightforward, right? The, the cookie cutter is, view yeah. of forestry is like, oh, look, trees. I go get the trees, and then I guess I put some trees back. Yay. No, yeah. <laughs> so much more water, wildlife, yeah. you know, genetic biodiversity, the whole thing, everything we've talked about. Yeah. It's this massive moving yeah. many variable puzzle that you tweak one thing and everything else shifts. Yeah. Change one thing, changes everything. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very, very large, very complicated. Yeah. And that's just the nature of, of an ecosystem. Super interesting. Is, is connected, right? You yeah. Pull one plant species out, it affects like every ungulate, it affects these insects. It's the the food web right the, yeah the way everything's interconnected everything yeah no totally no it's it's uh it's interesting stuff and we try to manage for that well, which is such a bold <laughs> such a bold strategy like yeah we're gonna try to keep everything well as soon on as, the ice at once well it's it's one of those things right where as soon as humans stepped onto the landscape as soon as we decided we were going to take a role in being in the area even just yeah. Yeah, as soon as as soon it, as we settle in, as soon as we settle in, we change we the landscape. Impact. As soon as we're here, we change everything. So, by being here, we need to manage here. We can't just leave it alone. It has to be managed now. That's the situation we're in, and we do a pretty good job of it. Yeah, yeah. No, there are there are much worse places in the world doing much poorer jobs. Yeah. than the North American forest industry. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's pretty impressive to think about the things that the forest industry pulls off, actually. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot going on. Little bonkers sometimes. Yeah, and the yeah, just diversity of careers, the diversity of interests. I call it a different job in this industry, like a different role every two years, and probably not hit everything. Yeah, probably. Oh yeah, almost definitely. Actually, yeah. Yeah. No, there's a lot going on. Yeah, when we say forestry, it's and you not would just suck cutting at all trees. Of them. <laughs> and what's that? <laughs> I, I would suck at all of them. I, I don't mean anything against you. I'm saying if you did two years oh, yeah, no. of one thing, you're not that's not long enough to specialize in anything. No. You're just kind of getting a yeah. little bit of a feel for it. Yeah, jack of all job, trades, jack type situation. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, totally. But uh, yeah, so that's that's a more in depth talk about sustainable forest management. Um, if you have any questions, if anything has sounded completely out to lunch to you, if you think we're full of it. Or which we are. Which we are. Definitely. Just yeah. remember, we're not saying that we are the best people to talk about this, but no one else is talking about it, you know, on <laughs> so, or social media or anything like that. So we're talking about it amongst ourselves, but the... Uh, I love our logic. We're not the best, but we're all you have. So yeah. put up with it. Yeah, so put up with it. Put up with <laughs> That's us. That's all you got. Uh, and yeah, like I said, if you guys have any questions... Send me an email, yourforestpodcast at gmail.com, and I will try to get back to you. So far, I have no questions, which is not surprising whatsoever. And but, where can they find the podcast? What are all your platforms? Where the so it's on available? iTunes. If you're listening to this, you've obviously found it, and it's at the end of the podcast. So, But it's on Tell iTunes. Your friends, it's on a it's bunch also, of things. Yeah, it's on iTunes. It's also on the yourforestpodcast.com website. You can find it on there. They'll all show up on there. And uh, yeah, hopefully eventually I can get them onto Android and you know, to a Google option. Yeah, SoundCloud, all that other stuff, right? So yep. right now iTunes is the main one, so I'm going to stick with that until I get my feet underneath me. Um, 
Yeah, so that's it. Uh, make sure to rate and review. Be honest. If you think it sucked, tell me it sucked. I got to know. <laughs> I don't want to waste all my time making a bunch of podcasts and find out that there's no market for it. You can tell Matt. I don't want to hear it. Yeah, Derek sense it. I did a great job today. Derek every does a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay well thanks again for listening guys appreciate it and uh yeah rate and review and we will talk to you next time